My main thought and feeling whenever I go into a school is that I want the kids to participate. There has to be something where they're interacting and participating involved. I don't want it to be a lecture or a talk. I don't want them to be sitting there passively listening to me, even if I'm telling them the most, most amazing things in the world. To me, it's interesting. To me, it's something everyone should know about and care about, but they have to kind of be involved. It's about exercising what I think are like three muscles. There's the empathy muscle, the imagination muscle, and there's the voice muscle. I want them thinking, responding, and articulating their thoughts and their feelings there and then in the classroom. And we might do that through song or poetry or drama. So at the end of the day, what I want them to do is to come out of there feeling more awake, more alive, more involved, and a sense of response, really, to all the issues we've talked about. We look at the Millennium Goals, and we look at famine, and we look at war, and we look at poverty, and we talk about gender, and we talk about climate change. But initially, often, they're not aware of it or they're not even sure if they care about it. Sometimes they're half interested. It can only happen by awakening them. And sometimes they don't even know that inside themselves they have this potential energy, sense of being involved, being participants rather than spectators. In my opinion, it's hugely important. We introduced Transition Year in our school three years ago and DevEd thankfully is now embedded in Transition Year. I had a very supportive principal at the time when we were bringing Transition Year into our school. I'm delighted we have it now. Very often in the past we've learned about the big issues out there, about starvation in Africa and about wars in history and wars far away, as if everything was all right where we are. And I think it's really, really important to link the global with the local because these issues of militarisation, of poverty, isolation, prejudice, they're right here on our doorstep wherever we are. And the place where we can be most effective is where we are right now. And also the personal, inside ourselves, where is the violence in me? Where is the prejudice in me? And to challenge it there because it starts with ourselves. It's talking about human rights, environmental rights. It's not just about the big issues far, far away, but the issues locally and also personally. DevEd and Global Education isn't just about learning what's wrong, it's about learning about what's right. It's about learning about what I can do as an individual and in association with others, whether it's my family, my class, my school, my community, my workplace, to help make the world a safer and a better place for everybody. It's about empowerment and it's about well-being for all of us and for the whole planet. It's really vital. Paulo Freire is really the basis of development education, really, because for him it was really education is about transformative change and about creating a more fair and just world. And he would say it's radical transformation and that's really about getting to the root causes of the issues and addressing those. So for him it was really about the emotive connection that people have to have with the issue to be able to take an action. And in terms of facilitation, which is really key to DevEd and your methodologies, that participants and students are not vessels to fill with information, but really that you can engage your students and that you can help facilitate them learning through dialogue, learning from each other, peer kind of learning so that they can unpack what they feel and what they know about issues and that that kind of really helps with the connection. But the action can just get bigger and it can grow over time. You can have more inputs, you can act and you can reflect and that really deepens that engagement, that confidence that you can create meaningful change for a just and sustainable world. I think anything that physically moves students and emotionally moves students is really powerful. I love role plays, simulation games, moving debates even can be fantastic because what you want to do is unlock the students' ideas or their thoughts or their feelings about issues and that can be really, really powerful. In a classroom you'll have different learning styles and to try and have different activities that can engage different students as you're going along, I think that can be really important. There's an activity we use in association with the story of Muhammad Ali. Heavyweight world champion in the 60s, refused to go to Vietnam. When he was asked by a reporter, why won't you go, sir, to Vietnam? He said, my conscience won't let me go shoot my brother. We use that story, that reply from Ali, to why he wouldn't go to fight in the Vietnam War. We start off with, first of all, put Ali in that matrix, right? My conscience won't let me go shoot my brother. This means I will not go to Vietnam. The consequences for me are I lose my world title. 
title. I lose my passport. I lose my license to fight. I may go to prison. In order to do this, I get my strength from, and in his case, it was his faith. So then you've got a group of young people. Give them time to reflect, and you go around the circle. We asked them, my conscience won't let me. Whatever, right round. Then you go into the second strand, my conscience won't let me. This means the consequences for me are likely to be, I get my strength to do this from, and all the time you're building up an energy in the room. The ball of wool can be, I'm James, my conscience won't let me use herbicide. This means I'm going to let my garden grow wild. The consequences for this are, the neighbors might talk. I get the strength to do this from my love of nature. I've got the ball of wool. Someone else in the room are thinking maybe my conscience won't let me kill animals. So they can raise their hand because they see a connection. So I throw the ball of wool. And so the wool goes round and round to create a web. And at the end of it, you have a web of conscience and a web of solidarity and a web of strength. So we don't feel in isolation. We see, ah, we think we're working on different issues. We think we've got different opinions, but really we're all connected. One of the things I like to do is get the young people out of their chairs, out of their seats and on their feet. It's not just about telling them about stuff, it's kind of trying to show them to experience it. Just the second project which we're working on is looking at the impact of war and the money that's spent on the arms industry. We have endless, endless, endless conflict and new wars and the war between rich and poor as well as the military wars. And meantime, our millennium goals, do we achieve any of them? No, we had to rejig the goalposts to have the new sustainable development goals. So rather than just go into classroom and say, talk about this, I try to illustrate it. And one of the ways we illustrate it is through this idea of the two cues. So I get the kids to get out of their chairs, stand in the classroom in two lines as if they're queuing up for two fast food counters. One queue are queuing for weapons, and the other queue are queuing for Millennium Gold type things. Clean water, do something about climate change, gender, war, poverty. And the statistic we work with is that just 10% less on the military spend would pay for all those wonderful things. Our queue for weapons has to go around 10 times as fast as the queue for the Millennium Goals. And afterwards we talk about it, what it was like to be in that slow queue the frustration and the anger and the irritation and the boredom and all the feelings that come up from being part of this and seeing this weapons queue flying around. And we talk about what would that be like if that was your school canteen and every day you were always in the slow queue and you never got to eat and all the time you watch this other queue whizzing around, what would you do? So the only answer seems to be, well, we've got to slow down that queue and speed up our queue. We've not only just talked about it, we've shown it. They've experienced it too. They've stood there and got annoyed and angry and fed up and irritated and felt, oh yeah, this is what it's like when things are so grossly unfair. Theatre and drama can be extremely powerful in DevEd. It really can connect the students with the issues. They can feel it. It's experiential. They process it and they internalise it, which is fantastic, and that's really a good driver. But for some students, that's not going to work. So you also have to ensure when you're doing theatre that you do create space for passive roles and for people to be able to have more of a watching role, and they can feed back, and that's totally fine. But to give space for that also is really important. Every time there's an AFRI event, there's music, there's, there's drama, there's just that splash of creativity. So throughout the teacher training and all the work that we would be doing in schools, it allows people to get into a different kind of headspace that's beyond the thinking brain. It's stimulating a part of their soul or their body awareness or some other part of them that wouldn't be able to reach if we were only to think in our head way of thinking. It's participatory. It's getting out of your chair and it's doing it. You experience it in your body and in your soul and your heart and your mind and your guts when you're throwing yourself around improvising and working around these amazing themes like the arms trade, poverty, hunger, climate change, and trying to find ways of showing that visually in shapes and patterns. An hour and a half lecture can be condensed into a 15 minute piece of theater to the extent that even small children can just get it. It cuts across language. And I think the thing is because they participated, the kids also never forget that. You can have a plan and you can have things that you'd like to bring into the room but you have to come into the space and say who's in the room, what do they bring to the room, what do they need, what do I need, what are the challenges, what are the gifts. There's no real division between the teacher or facilitator and the student. We're all students, we're all facilitators, we're all teachers. More than anything it's really important to see that and also to teach DevEd in a way that's in accordance with the ethics or the principles that you're wanting to get across. 
So for example, if you're talking about peace and you're talking about diversity and you're talking about food sovereignty, you need to bring those principles right into the space and into your methodology. There's no point talking about democracy if you don't have a democratic system working in the space with the students. At the minute, there are hundreds of thousands of young people on the streets all over the world about gun control. There are young Palestinian people speaking out and saying no more. And so we have fantastic ambassadors for peace and justice and human rights and sustainability among our young people. It's just such a fantastic time to be on the planet. And in AFRI, we have traditionally used stories of young people who have been faced with situations of violence and injustice and who either themselves have come through that or maybe they have lost their lives, but others have been inspired by their story and by what's happened to them. For example, we've had stories of Sadako Sasaki, Asila Slay, Malala Yousafzai, Celia Griffin, the list goes on and on. Personally, I love stories. In my experience, people in general, and especially young people, really identify with stories, and especially stories about people around their same age who have overcome huge obstacles and made huge difference on the planet. There is so much that you can cover in development education that will touch the hearts and minds of practically every student. I mean, it's about empathy, it's about educating. It's very easy to get the students on board. There are so many options. The resources that are available, the organizations, the supports, worldwide global schools, groups like AFRI. But even in a practical sense, it can be as you wish to take it. You can tailor them locally. We can have trips outside. We've gone to Trocra Schools Day. We've gone to Concern Teamed Days. The National Youth Council of Ireland have taken students out on AFRI Days. So there are so, so many possibilities. I think the easiest thing to do is look at what you're already doing. DevEd is in everything. It might just not be called DevEd. It could be called something else. So really seeing what you're doing, making links. The most easy way to do that is through your curriculum. So Worldwide Global Schools, we actually have Doing D series, which help you teach your subject but through a global lens but actually can meet your statements of learning. I think particularly to have a student to be able to learn a subject from very different perspectives in the different subject areas can really cement their learning and get them to think. If you're looking to do more extracurricular things in your school, it can be really interesting to look at the global goals. So your students get like a broad range of all of the global justice issues that there are, and then that they can zoom in on one that they're particularly passionate about. Because if you have a group of students that are really passionate, they will drive the activities, they'll do the work for you. And that's fantastic and it's really inspiring. But there are loads of resources that you can access. There's obviously our own resources in Wild West Global Schools, developmenteducation.ie, which is organized by themes and classes. So you can quickly go in and look and pull out some activities from there. Be prepared to be exhausted. <laughs> you have to have a certain amount of stamina but I think the main thing is to really remind yourself constantly that dealing with serious issues can be fun and that's the thing you're trying to get over to the kids is hey look we're going to explore all this stuff and it's really important but we can enjoy this. This can be fun doing this. Okay you can write a song about poverty and hunger or injustice and you know the song's important but then you go out and sing it and you share it with other people and that's really enjoyable and it's a fantastic experience and a great feeling and incredibly empowering. Not only are you empowering the children through participation and through drama, the fun and the pleasure of experimenting and exploring and improvising and discovering new ways of looking at the issues. I don't think I've ever done a class met a new group of kids or adults or any group without learning something myself from them. Be flexible, have your plan, know what you're going to do, have loads of ideas, but it could be at the last minute the kids are not there, you've got a different group, the class is cut in half, you might have to completely kind of change your plan around about what you, you hope to achieve and not to get disappointed or deflated when things don't work out that day and to have a kind of an overview of the whole project. You can put a huge amount of work into preparing a class as a drama teacher but you have to really think on your feet and be very flexible and be willing to just go with the flow and sometimes the flow is things don't work out the way you want them to. Have a sense of not being thrown by it, even enjoying the chaos and seeing that as part of the project in a way. There's some fantastic links obviously with history. For Junior Cycle you've strands two and three looking at the history of 
Ireland, Europe and the world. In Senior Cycle you also have it in Topics 5 and 6, looking at all of the different wars, the impacts of conflict, resolution, religious education. In Senior Cycle, the Peace and Justice strand, so you're looking at solutions then as well to militarisation issues. For climate change, you've got your natural links there with science and geography. Then you can also unpack a little bit more in the Earth and Space strand, the impacts but also some solutions in terms of energy. Then if you move on to famine, the obvious link between the Irish famine and the famines across the world and why that happened and what the causes of those were. Food security, you look at food in, in home economics and senior cycle, there's strong sustainability strands there and also in your agricultural science which is asking learners to consider the local, regional and global issues, challenges and opportunities and make decisions around those so they're really looking at how you can build more sustainable food systems. Thank you.